So, classification. Conical, linear, effigy, enclosures, and temple and platform. I want to give you some examples of these. Conical and linear mounds. Well, the people lived in huts and longhouses. So the souls of the people who were buried were buried in mounds that looked like huts and in long uh, lines, linears, that looked like longhouses. The effigy mounds, first of all, there were 12 Ho-Chunk clans. So at the time that the Europeans arrived, there were four clans in the air, and the Ho-Chunk are very clear on this. There were just two divisions, but the, so there was the upper division, which were the air clans, and there was the lower division, but it had two divisions. It had the earth and the water. And so the, uh, <coughs> sometimes there can be confusion because it looks like there's three realms, a water realm, an earth realm, and an air realm. But in terms of the uh, divisions, Ho-Chunk wanted it to be considered just two. The uh, land divisions were, uh, uh, let's just see here. Oh, yeah, I, I want to say beforehand that while there were 12 clans, there is confusion over whether there were any wolf, buffalo, or fish clans uh, effigies and uh, Radden has on page 32 that some authority believes that, that, that they never built them and in another place he says that there were no elk, buffalo, snake or fish clans. However, the uh, D. Smith who was a Nebraskan Ho-Chunk has declared that the linear looking mounds at the Effigy Mounds National Monument are actually snake mounds and the Ho-Chunk in Wisconsin believe they were fish mounds. So when you're trying to do research in this area, sometimes there's confusion over uh, what is a mound and what is a linear mound and, and so on. All I'm trying to do right now is identify that I'm aware that there was this and when I decide to declare a mound uh, that looks linear as an effigy, I will say that and I'll tell you which authority I'm going to use. Okay. So the air clans, thunderbirds, hawks, eagles, and pigeons. By the time the um, Europeans arrived in Wisconsin, there was no pigeon clan. The Potawatomi had a pigeon clan, and the Menominee had a pigeon clan, but the Ho-Chunk did not have a pigeon clan. And most people agree with that. So the effigy mouse divided into two divisions, but three realms. The land clans were bear, buffalo, deer, elk, and wolf. And even though some people don't think there was an elk or a wolf or a buffalo, there are many sites where these are identified as the effigies. Finally, there were three uh, water clans, water spirits, snake, and fish. So of those 12 clans, one was extinct, but there are still pigeon effigies because they were alive when that occurred, when, when they were being built. Here's an example at the Effigy Miles National Monument with the group called the Marching Bears. If you had time, you could count 10 bears. You would see that there are three birds, two birds here and here, and one bird here. And then there are two green, uh, what look like linear mounds that one authority has just declared as snake mounds. And if they were snake mounds, that would mean that there was a representative at this very important site of a water clan, a land clan and an air clan. And for a site to be sacred, there are usually representatives from each of the clans, which gives that site more power. Here's an example of some uh, mounds, which have these, uh, the line that have the, the, these little conical marks in them. These are called fish mounds. So I've had some authorities tell me there can't be any doubt about those. I put that out just for your awareness. All right. All right, so under effigy mounds, there were not only clan effigies, but there were non-clan effigies, and I'm identifying two. There were turtles and there were geese. And later in the presentation, I will show you how they picked a turtle to make a statement and they picked a goose to make a statement. So each of the clans had a role. So when the Europeans arrived, the Thunderbird clan was the dominant clan. Prior to that, the Water Spirit Clan was allegedly the dominant clan. Now, this information really comes from Radden in his book, where he describes uh, what appears to have been an evolution in the power struggle among the clans. 
Um, and he gives a brief but clear description of the roles of the clans. And the one I'm focusing on is the water spirit clan because the water spirits got called panthers by the Europeans when in fact they were really, if anything, a water panther. Wisconsin had no panthers in, in the area and it was a way to capture that this entity, which was a water entity, could change its shape. And <clears throat> Radden makes the statement that the water spirit clan were partly evil and partly good. They messed around. They were more connected to the old culture with the figure trickster than they were to the emerging Thunderbird culture, which was more connected to shaman and so on. So, another interesting thing to note here is that for all the clans except the Thunderbird, there was an actual animal. In other words, the water spirit animal was a lizard, uh, the bear clan was a bear, and so on. But the Thunderbirds were actually um, a symbolic uh, compilation of a magnificent thunderstorm. And the eyes of the Thunderbird were the flash of lightning, and the wings of the Thunderbird were the roar of the, of the thunder. But you couldn't put on uh, Thunderbird uh, feathers. You could not put on a Thunderbird skin. And the evolution of the Thunderbirds is actually similar to the evolution of the use of symbols by the people because you had to keep an imaginative idea with inside yourself to be a Thunderbird. But if you were a member of the Bear Clan, you were kind of like a, a blue shirt worker. You had, there were bears, you followed them, you learned about them, you killed them, you ate them, you dressed in their skins. So what the Thunderbird clan did was they took the most dramatic aspect of the Water Spirit clan and claimed it for themselves, <laughs> Thunder and Lightning. Now, that's my interpretation of how the Thunderbird emerged as the dominant clan from the Water Spirit clan. But there can't be any doubt that there were no Thunderbirds. So you won't come to a Thunderbird chief and find a Thunderbird feather from that bird. He may have a feather, but it's from something else. So Radden's process was he, um, he reached out to the Ho-Chunk community and was, spoke to all the elders that he could find, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and they shared lodge stories with him, and that's how he drew his conclusions, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. So actually, this might be a good spot just to underline his importance. So first of all, he lived with the Ho-Chunk for about seven years. He learned their language. He had seven or eight or nine close informants, as they're called, and they gave him a name called uh, Stands on Water. That's a pretty powerful name. We've all seen Dances with Wolves, but Stands on Water is practically Christ-like. And he is, uh, <clears throat> he wrote his book uh, in, in uh, 2013, or sorry, 1913, so it was a hundred years ago that he had his adventure in the Ho-Chunk, both in Nebraska and in Wisconsin, and he doesn't hesitate if there are different versions of a story or if the clans don't have the same uh, understanding of what happened. He's quite fair about this, and what he does as any good scientist is he tells you what he heard. And there are times when he draws conclusions from it, but then he says they're his conclusions. The question I've had as I've gotten to know him in his various books is um, he, he is a unique window into the Ho-Chunk culture, both the Nebraska and the, and the Wisconsin uh, uh, groups, that helps a European, a person like myself, understand, given my thought processes, what he found when he connected with them. And he is in not so good stead with the Ho-Chunk today, at least the Ho-Chunk that I've talked with. They don't always endorse his views and they don't have to endorse his views. He's just telling us what, his, what he encountered. And I find that helpful when I'm trying to draw my conclusions. I like to factor in if there's something that he said. And I've also found with some of the anthropologists, in particular Amy uh, Roseborough, who said, uh, when I've asked questions to her, oh, you'll have to ask Rat you'll have to ask the Ho Chunk, or you'll have to read it in Radden. In other words, when you're at the limit of her knowledge, she defers to 
the, the Ho Chunk probably know the answer, or Radden has an answer, and I found that to, to be helpful. So actually, and I put in this slide that the Thunderbirds had the power of the thunder and lightning of a thunderstorm, and Amy Rosenberg was out on uh, South Dakota on a dig years ago when they were uh, caught in a thunderstorm, and they were the highest uh, elevation <laughs> on the land. There wasn't a tree, there wasn't a rock, there wasn't a stump. They laid flat on the ground and were terrified that they were going to be struck by lightning, you see, because the Ho-Chunk were, or the Thunderbird clam was maybe a little unhappy that they were out there. <laughs> anyway, so that's the, uh, the clan relationships. But, so the clan Thunderbird has no actual bird referent, but in my view, they represent a cognitive maturation, or another cognitive development, in the way they th people thought and the conceptual ability of the clans. And <clears throat> so I've, I've cataloged just a few of these, just to, to, for us to file away as we're trying to look at the difference between the old culture and the new culture. First of all, just the symbolism is, is clearer in the Thunderbirds. You have to hold that whole idea of a Thunderbird in your mind, because you can't see it, it's not concrete. Gardens, farming, it's the advent of symbols. It's the whole idea of the kernel of corn and seeing the cob of corn months later. There was an evolution in cord pottery and small projectile points. And then, this is something I'm adding to this, and that is, I think that they, there were tra they lived in a world of transformations. There were magical transformations, and then they, they themselves uh, came up with intentional transformations. And so I will describe to you three principles of placement of the mounds. And the third one is another one of these cognitive steps where they intended, they, they took a plan that was inside them and they put it on the ground and they didn't just respond to the ground, such as there's a ridge of hills, so we'll put our mounds on top of the hills. That principle is called conforming to the, uh, the contours of the land. So I'm just giving four steps or four things that change from the old culture uh, and that's uh, clear in the effigy mounds culture. All right, we're still trying to get this classification. Enclosure mounds would be a third kind of mound. Here's an example from Lappin's book of uh, linear mounds around the lake as a, as a guarding way for the people that might live in the middle. And then there are temple platform mounds of which the classic one is Cahokia. This is on the, uh, uh, the UN uh, uh, International Treasure Sites and people know about Monk's Mound and so on. But we had a similar place here in uh, Wisconsin at Aztalan. And so what we have is a, a palisade around an enclosure on what's here. It's called the West Bank of the Rock River. It's now called the Crawfish River. And this is a site studied now by our archaeologists and they're coming up with very intriguing findings. So the, and in the corners there were platform mounds. Uh, not as large as at Aztalan. So what we have then is conical linear, effigy, uh, circular or, or uh, uh, enclosure mounds and then temple and platform mounds. <clears throat>